Yeah, welcome back. It's still the breakfast and we've been having very serious conversations here, you know, ranging from uh, the humanitarian dilemma right here in Nigeria. I mean, an aid worker with the United Nations was abducted just on Saturday. Actually, the facts of the case was that uh, we're talking about the bandits, you know, disguised in army uniform, military uniform. They basically blocked the road and they abducted about 20 passengers. But one of them, unfortunately, is an aid worker with the UN. And we see that this issue is a recurring one time and time again. Over the years, aid workers have been repeatedly abducted, kidnapped, killed, you know, executed, you know, you know, online, live videos. And it's just been so, so, so chilling. Really and, sad. you know, we just hope that they're able to quickly rescue this one you who know, was abducted on Saturday. And joining us now to discuss this is uh, Audu Liberty. He works uh, with an aid organization. Thank you very much for joining us. So we'd like to find out. It, it's been very frequent, you know, hearing news of, you know, abduction of aid workers in Nigeria. What's your reaction to this news over the weekend that there's been yet another abduction of an aid worker? Well, it is very unfortunate that this is happening and um, the aid workers didn't do anything wrong. The, the, the only offense uh, is that um, they are trying to help people who, uh, are, who are the survivors of conflict. So you see them going interior, into the interior communities where even the government officials and the army can't go to, but they are being abducted. It's really unfortunate. And this can't be allowed to be happening. But, but again, uh, it's becoming a recurring decima. And, and, and it's, it baffles me that this happens on and on, and governments seem not to be doing anything. But I also understand the dynamics. The dynamics have always been that uh, I, 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 I stand to be corrected. And each time I say this, I take full responsibility of it. And, and that's to say that What's happening in the north part, northern part of the country, particularly in the northeast and the northwest, is nothing but conflict in Tapra. You know, people are making money. And even the governor of the state, uh, the Bono state governor, had come out to say that the army people are, are afraid and has oftentimes accused the army of um, orchestrating this kind of thing. But, you know, but I also feel disappointed that the aid to... to, to to, to the governors, the media aides, are saying that uh, despite the problem that uh, insecurity has really been improved in the northern part of the country. So it's not about politics, it's about, it's about security. So people need to understand that Nigerian state, the primary responsibility of the government is to provide security. And if we do not address this, time comes when, because it's, so, it's obvious now that the people who do this know that they can do it and get away with this. I am not right. convinced. There's no amount of story you will tell me. You can't convince me that the Nigerian army can't bring an end to Boko Haram. And I'm one of those who had argued that I don't even need the army to do this. You only need the mobile people to do this. And allow them to do their job. We should remove politics. We should remove corruption and security um, conflict entrepreneur. Things will get better. All right, Mr. Alsaini, I, I, um, of course, you know, we mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the aid worker. He works with the UNHCR. Um, but, of course, it's not belittling the um, lives of the other 20 or maybe even up to 50 that were kidnapped alongside this aid worker. Um, and so we're back to talking um, about insecurity, about kidnappings on a scale that we maybe have never seen before. Um, you already, you know, had started moving in that direction. But before we get into talking about the government's failure to um, secure a highway, because this is Meduguri Damaturu Highway, it's it's not it's not a planet, it's not a it's not a continent, it's just a highway, just roads. Um, but let's talk, you know, about the details of the story. Say that the aid worker was singled out. Um, they were asked to show their ID cards. He showed his, and he was singled out. And of course, the rest were let to um, go off. Is there a particular reason why that may have happened? Is there something about aid workers that these bandits or these terrorists um, are attracted to? Are ransoms may be paid, you know, that they might be attracted to? Well, well two, things, two things. One is that it's a UN worker. 
as a UN staff, when you take a UN staff, it's a big story. It's a big, it's a national issue. It's a global issue. Um, because we are UN staff, uh, it's a global issue. So they are making a statement. Two is that when you pick such a staff, you know they will come for negotiation. The UN will come for negotiation. Nigerian state will come for negotiation. Ransom will be paid. Okay? So you realize that two things are involved. One, we want to make a, a statement that we can do this. You know, they've seen him, they've taken him, they need ransom paid. Otherwise, another way around, they could also feel that, okay, these are people who are making the, the victims, the survivors, who are supporting the survivors. They could get angry and kill him because they are not even really happy because they are even providing intervention for people they expect to, to be suffering. So because, oh, you are the guys, so you want to show us that we cannot cripple the community. They get angry and kill him. And when you kill a UN, a UN worker, it's, an, it's, it's a dance of the Nigerian state. You know, two things are going to happen at the end of the day. Ransom will pay, he will be released, or he may be killed to, to prove a point that we need, to, of course, they want to instill fear. To stop the United Nations from, you know, deploying aid worker to the aid workers to the places they, they feel um, shouldn't go. So, so these are the things that that's, that's are happening. I think these are the basic reasons. They, they because they singled him out when they saw his ID card, they realized ah, this is a big fish. And when we pick him, that that's that's um, we are likely going to to, that's to make really, that's really sad. out of out of this capture. Really, really sad. So, Sunny, according to uh, international laws like the International Humanitarian Law, the Geneva Convention, in situations of armed conflict, you know, it's stipulated that aid workers, vulnerable people, women and children should be spared. You know, your combat should just be with the military uh, elements. But we see that it, the reverse is the case. When there are cases of uh, insecurity, it's actually the vulnerable people and the people that should be protected that are now attacked, taken as hostages and all that. They don't have consideration for that. And why do you think that persists? You, you did mention some points before, talking about how you know, this you know, culture of impunity, they've continued and continued, and nothing's been done. But why else do you think this has become a new normal, especially in Northeast Nigeria? Don't forget that you people are talking about Aboko Haram members. You're talking about insurgents. What's their business with, with, with um, um, rule of engagement? They even understand what is rule of engagement. Even the Nigerian army does not obey rule of engagement. Mm. So why do you expect Boko Haram members to obey rule of engagement when even the institution, the Nigerian army, doesn't obey the rule of engagement? These are guys who shoot people with arts, craft, arts aircraft gone. You know? So, so for them, it's not about all you're talking about the rule of engagement doesn't exist as far as they are concerned, you know. So their agenda is to, to, to cripple the state, cripple the society. So that's, that's what it is. So if you if you begin to talk about the rule of engagement, you can't be talking. Of course, the Geneva Convention it exists. The rule of engagement that has to be followed, children and women and other people. But you can't be talking about rule of engagement when you are discussing Boko Haram. You don't expect Boko Haram members to obey rule of engagement. They don't even understand what you're talking about. So when you talk about rule of engagement, when you discuss issues about Boko Haram, you're wasting your time because these are guys. The only understanding they have is to kill, destroy. Who loot, you know, a raise funds through kidnapping and all that right of it. That's, uh, that's what it is. Not long ago, we uh, heard a story of the United States coming in to uh, rescue um, a citizen here in Nigeria that was kidnapped in Niger. Um, the Nigerian government, of course, lately has also been in some quarters praised for its uh, rescue of the Kankara school boys and in the past, of course, uh, the Dapchi school girls. Uh, but some people may also rate them poorly with regards um, rescue um, of kidnapped uh, uh, persons in Nigeria. Um, do you, of course, from your observance and the things that you know, uh, do you have any hope that this aid worker and the rest of them that have been kidnapped uh, might make it out um, alive? Well, I pray not to go not to not to go emotional, and I just pray I I I, I be myself. You see, we made mention of Kankara school boys. For God goodness sake, for the sake of man and humanity, how do we define or how do you explain that over three hundred persons were taken at the some say on a bike? And he didn't see them close to 72 hours. And the story we heard was that 
the Meiti Island negotiated for their release. And the Nigerian state oh. lied that they didn't pay ransom. Well, the, the Nigerian army service. eventually, um, you know, stated that they, of course, uh, through a military operation, were, you know, were the ones who rescued the boys and not through Meiti Ala. As we speak today, as we speak today, there is no clear factual conversation about how the Kankara boys were released. The army claims they did that. The, the, the Zafara state government, if I'm not mistaken, claimed he did that. The Meiti Allah said they did that. In short, there are, there's also a story of how the, the vigilante did that. So when you have a country where there's, where there's, where there's a lot of impunity, a lot of lies, nobody is held responsible. As we speak today, nobody has resigned in the army. For that huge failure, nobody has resigned. We have not heard that anybody resigned. Nobody has been sacked. And let me say, let me say clearly, that the aid work, people are being kidnapped every day in the northern part of the country. Not even on the highway. People come to people's home to take them. In Kaduna, is a, in short, let me tell you something. It is in, it's a man, anybody who does not have the fear of God, that would think, that, that, that uh, there's no problem. So reality is, you made mention of how the American soldiers came into Nigeria and rescued, um, rescued um, their citizen. That tells you clearly, this is not, this is not a rocket science. The Nigerian states, Nigerian states just refused to do what they are supposed to do. That situation basically shows that it is possible. Sorry. I mean, the rescue, the, the American rescue of the citizens shows that this is possible. Uh, anyway, you work with NGO on the ground, you know, in NGOs that, you know, go yeah. through these situations. How would you say that uh, this situation of abduction of aid workers, how would you say it affects the morale of staff? And how would you say it uh, affects the humanitarian crisis in the north? Because you need these people on ground to provide food, to help rescue, uh, to help shelter these people, provide welfare and all of that. And now they're being kidnapped and abducted. How would you say it affects the humanitarian crisis in the north and affects the morale of people who maybe even leave other countries to come to Nigeria or even Nigerians live in other states to go to the northeast to help the situation? Of course, it does. Many people don't feel comfortable going to the Northeast. And those who go to the Northeast, even if we take flights to enter Medjugorje or any other part of the North Northeast, you are not likely to go to interior communities to do this job. Okay? And some donor agencies, some, some aid agencies, are not even ready to deploy their staff. There are some communities they've even decided they're not going to go to, okay? Because they know that when you get to that community, you're not likely going to come back. And of course, you know you're operating in a society, in a country where when they pick you, it becomes story. Some are being denied, right? And those that are not being denied, the, the, there's, no, there's, no, there's no security assurance that there'll be activation of state mechanisms to get you released. So in a situation like this, definitely it's going to dampen the morale of All the right. aid workers. Um, they will say. just go to city centers. Thank you very much Hello. for for thank you very much for being here on the news. Audio Seni Coordinator, Media Advocacy West Africa Foundation. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. We're going to a very short break here, and the conversation continues with uh, a very big story about following the money. Is that right? Yes, it is. 3.8 billion naira is what we're talking about next in the uh, health sector, right after the short break. <laughs>